All right, so the question is, is there a banking crisis? And if so, what should I do with my money? Now, the article here is New York Times. Uh, a question about your money. Has anything truly changed this week? Watching the banking industry descend into turmoil is unnerving. But unless your financial goals have changed, embrace in action. So basically, what are they telling you? First of all, the last thing that these people want is for you to get the bright idea to make a run on the bank. That's the last thing they want you to do. And by run on the bank, what we're saying is they don't want you to suddenly decide that you're going to go to the bank and withdraw your money because you suddenly feel that you can't trust the bank. There are a lot of people out there who come from countries that they don't trust banks. There's a lot of people out there who, for whatever reason, they have many reasons to distrust the banks, or perhaps they uh, have had negative uh, experiences. I've had negative experiences with the bank. Back slightly before the 2008 financial crisis, I had a negative experience. I believe it was with Washington Mutual. It used to be Dime, and I wasn't happy with Dime. No, I was happy with Dime, but Washington Mutual ended up taking Dime over. Everything was going fine with me and Dime Savings Bank. Everything was going just fine. But when Washington Mutual took over, they changed some of the policies. Specifically, they had canceled out my overdraft protection. And then they started doing things that just really, really annoyed me. They uh, sent me a thing in the mail, said, oh, yeah, well, you owe us like $300. And I was like, yeah, well, nobody told you to cancel my goddamn overdrive protection. Not only that, I never made an account with you. I didn't want to be with you in the first place. So banks buy each other. Banks consume each other. This happens all the time. And uh, sometimes this is done because you have uh, smaller banks and their stock gets bought out or there's like a hostile takeover. There could be a number of reasons. <laughs> But the question is, well, what do you do with your money? So that's what this is about. It says watching the banking industry descend into turmoil is unnerving. But unless your financial goals have changed, embrace an action. It says banks failed. Rich men became publicly agitated, demanding protection. Regulators stepped in to try to stop the panic. Markets wobbled anyway. And now we everyday actors in the economy are supposed to do what exactly? It's not a rhetorical question. Too many people default towards immediate action in the face of what seems like a threat. Change banks, buy gold, sell everything or something at least. So, uh, again, what they're basically saying is don't do anything. Stay still and just let this pass. Now, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of these uh, articles that have been written. Uh, CNN global banking crisis. What just happened? That's just another one. Um, last Friday, the biggest failure of a U.S. bank since the global financial crisis was playing out in real time as a major lender to the tech industry succumbed to a classic bank run. Silicon Valley Bank's customers were frantically pulling their money from the California-based lender before U.S. regulators intervened to take control. But the collapse panicked markets, piling pain on weaker financial institutions already struggling with the unintended consequences of soaring interest rates and self-inflicted wounds. A week on, a second U.S. Regular, regional bank, Signature Bank, had been shut down. A third, First Republic Bank, has been propped up. And the major threat since 2008, the first major threat since 2008 to a bank of global financial significance, Credit Suisse, has been averted, at least for now. But the relative calm has been restored only thanks to the provision of huge sums of emergency cash from lenders of last resort, central banks, and some of the industry's strongest players. Markets remain on edge. Benchmark indexes of shares in U.S. and European banks have lost 20% and 13% respectively since the close of trading last Wednesday. Wall Street opened lower Friday and First Republic shares tumbled by about 16%. What just happened? U.S. government's Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation took control of SBB. It was the biggest banking collapse in America since Washington Mutual in 2008. Yes, <laughs> notice I mentioned Washington Mutual a little while ago. 
The wheels started to come off 48 hours later when the bank took a multi-billion dollar loss cashing out U.S. government bonds to raise money to pay depositors. It tried unsuccessfully to sell shares to shore up its finances that triggered the panic that led to its downfall. The FDIC shut down Signature Bank after a run on its deposits by customers who were spooked by the implosion of SBB. Both banks had an unusually high ratio of uninsured deposits to fund their businesses. After watching shares in Credit Suisse collapse by as much as 30%, Swiss authorities announced a backstop for the country's second biggest bank. It calmed the immediate market panic, but the global player is not out of the woods yet. Investors and customers are worried that it doesn't have a credible plan to reverse a long-term decline in its business. So then they go on and on, and they have a full timeline and this, that, and other. I think most of us have been paying enough attention in order to understand for the most part, your money is safe. It says, is my money safe? If you have less than $250,000 in an account at a U.S. bank insured by the FDIC, then you almost certainly have nothing to worry about. Joint accounts are insured up to um, sorry, $500,000, which basically means two people with $250,000 each, or it could be one person with up to $500,000. However, there's two people on the account, so it's a joint account, whether or not each person has a 50-50 share. European countries operate similar programs in Switzerland, up to 100,000 Swiss francs, $108,000 is insured per depositor. Now, you know what? what's funny, and let me just say this from a personal perspective. Uh, when I turned 18, I got it in my mind that I wanted a Swiss bank account. So I went online to see what it would take to open up a Swiss bank account. Funny thing, they said that in order to open up a bank account, I think the smallest amount of money you had to maintain in the bank was $15,000. Fast forward to now, and you've got this new bank, Citizens Bank, which I'm forced into because they took over my bank, Investors Bank. And you may have watched some of my videos where I took you to Investors Bank to show you, oh yeah, well, I was putting cash in in order to buy stock during the pandemic. They took over Investors Bank, and they also took over a percentage of HSBC, and the thing about it is these people are telling me that if you want a savings account with them where you earn about 4.75% interest, you have to have at least $25,000 in the bank. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Why would I have to put $25,000 in your bank and keep it in your bank just to earn a decent amount of interest on a savings account? I mean, that's ridiculous. Why would I have to? What? And I, I actually asked her because I was sitting with the bank manager. And I actually asked her, I was like, is this a Swiss bank? Why is your number so high? Doesn't make sense to me. Most banks give you, uh, what is it, uh, interest if you have just like 10000 in there. But 25000 I thought that was ridiculous. So uh, where are we? Customers of failed banks in the European Union are promised 100,000 euros of their deposit back, joint account holders can receive a combined 200,000 euros, which is $210,000, $211,000 really, in compensation. In the United Kingdom, depositors can have up to $102,484 returned if their bank goes under, doubling to $204,967 for joint accounts. Will all this make it harder to get a loan? The short answer is yes. Stress banks will pay much greater attention to the credit worthiness of borrowers. First of all, let me just say this before I continue. That's a good thing because that's what it's supposed to be in the first place. Stress banks will pay much greater attention to credit worthiness of borrowers, whether they're businesses looking for loans or home buyers trying to fund mortgages. If banks are under stress... They might be reluctant to lend. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said Thursday in testimony to the Senate Finance Committee, we could see credit become more expensive and less available. Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank, told reporters Thursday that persistently elevated market tensions could further constrict credit conditions that were already tightening in response to rising interest rates. Does this make a recession more likely? Now, first of all, the first thing they said is, yes, it does. I've been saying this for the longest time. You've been in recession since at least 2019, if you're an American. If you're a European, you may have been in recession longer than that. 
They don't like to use the word recession, and they've done everything they could to change the numbers and change the measurement in order to pretend that they are not in recession. What's worse is not only have you been in recession, but you've been in stagflation since COVID. Stagflation is a period of recession, unemployment, underemployment, and the most important thing to remember about stagflation there is a shrink of GDP, which definitely did happen to us during COVID because I mean, we weren't producing anything. But what they tried to do is they tried to say that consumer spending is how we should measure things. It's like, no, you don't measure things with consumer spending. You're printing welfare checks, sending them to people and telling them to go out and buy stuff. That is not how you measure GDP growth at all. So they're lying to you. But what I should say the worst part of stagflation that most people fail to recognize is poor government decisions. That is always the main part of stagflation. It's the one that they don't want to talk about. It's the one they don't want to teach you in your economics class. Poor government decisions is a major reason why you have stagflation. So it says, does this make recession more likely? Yes, it does. And I, you know what? I don't have to read all this because it's all numbers and bullshit. And then it's lies and conjecture. But the reality is you've been in recession since at least 2019. You've been in stagflation since at least 2020, March 18th. And right now, it doesn't take a genius to look around and say, you know what? The auto market looks like this. You know what? The housing market looks like this. Why is it that they're so concerned with the auto market and the housing market? Well, it's very simple. The number one largest investment that the average American makes is to buy a home, a house. That's the number one largest investment that the average American makes in their lifetime. The number two largest investment that most Americans make or series of investments is to buy cars. Cars have obviously long-term six, seven-year mortgages. It didn't used to be like that, but what's important to remember is the average price of a car has gone up while the average cost of living has gone up. So we're in, in the older days, it was like maybe a fifteen twenty thousand dollar car back in the eighties or the nineties that was considered a lot now twenty thousand dollars is about the entry price for a decent car while fifty thousand dollars tends to be about the average transaction price. I remember during covid they said that the average transaction price for a car had gone up to about forty seven thousand dollars. And then they were saying that the average homeowner who buys a car nowadays is paying around $1,000 a month for their car, their new car note. So what does that mean? That means that somebody probably ran out and bought an Acura MDX, or they went out and bought a Dodge Durango, or they bought a Jeep Grand Cherokee, or they bought some large crossover or some large SUV, or they bought some entry-level luxury car. Maybe they bought a Hyundai uh, Palisade or Kia, uh, uh, what is that thing, a Telluride. Or perhaps they even bought an electric car. Maybe they bought a Tesla this or a Tesla that. Maybe they bought a Model Y or a Model 3 Performance. The average cost of a new car has gone up to the point where they're paying about $1,000 per month. Some people can afford that because they're also not paying a mortgage because they can't have a house. They can't get a house. See, the, the, and this is where I want to shift to. The average person thinks that there's going to be a mortgage crisis or there's going to be a financial crisis in the housing industry. I really don't believe that's going to happen. But I will tell you this, because I buy and flip or buy and rent out homes as a landlord, what I can say I don't believe that there's going to be a financial crisis, but I am preparing my cash just in case as savings. So just in case I see a property come onto the market that I want, that I have the liquid money to walk in and try to buy it. Right now, foreign money like the Chinese, Asian markets, 
Right now, it's going to be a bit hard for them to walk in here and buy because their markets are a mess. The Evergrande scandal has broken them. So all I can say is if you don't have a house yet, that's what you should be saving for. Once you get yourself a house, then you're good. The mistake a lot of people made in 2018, 2019, and I've told the story numerous times, is what they did was they spent their money buying a luxury car. They were stuck in those loans, luxury cars, student loans. They were stuck in those loans when COVID rolled around and prices on homes not only went down, but interest rates dropped through the floor to below 3%. Problem was in 2021 through 2022, people started buying as many homes as they could possibly buy because they realized that was the only place they could put their money where for the future, long term, it would be safe, investment properties. So these people bought the houses up. Then, by the time Russia invaded uh, Ukraine uh, a year ago, Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. And believe me, there's a huge difference between a 3% and a 7%. There's a huge difference when you're talking about a 30-year fixed. There's a huge difference. I've showed you the loan calculator I use, Loan You Later. There is a gigantic difference. An absolute gigantic difference. I taught you to use loan you later in order to calculate loans. Now, the last property that I bought, let's see, what was it? $300,000, right? And the number of months is 360 months. That was a 30-year fix. Now, actually, uh, one of my properties, I refinanced down to a 20. You know, the tenants were paying it and everything. So I refinanced that when we had the chance down to a 3%. But let's just use this as an example. If you have a 3%, which is what we had on these properties, let's say a $300,000 loan, and you had a 3% interest rate, and you had 360 months, 30 years, 30 year fixed, right? Your monthly payments would only be $1,264 for the mortgage alone. And that's not factoring in taxes and insurance, which would probably add about six or $700 to the point where you'd only be paying $2,000 a month for an entire house. Your taxes and your insurance are coming out of that mortgage payment because they're escrowed. So you'd be paying a solid $2,000 a month or less for your house. My first house was only $1,800 mortgage, taxes, insurance. But at the end of this loan, you'd have spent $455,000 for a $300,000 house at the end of this loan. That's assuming that you didn't modify anything. That's assuming you didn't try to get smart and take out a home equity line of credit so that you could buy a car or some shit with it. As long as you did not alter that mortgage, your mortgage would only have cost you $455,000 by the time you finished paying off that house. That's one of the beauties of Loanulator. They show you exactly how much interest you will have paid, $155,000 in interest. However, this was slightly before 2020. You see, when COVID hit, Housing prices started to go up because people left the cities and they moved to the suburbs and bought up the houses that they could afford. Now, you're dealing with a lot of people who had a lot of cash and they had a lot of means. So these people were easily able to buy these houses up. So that same $300,000 house no longer cost $300,000. Now, we can if you look at any of the Zillows in New York City, you're looking at no less than about $500,000. So you've gone from three hundred dollars to 500000 And even if the interest rate was still 3%, now you'd be facing $2,108 just for the mortgage minus the taxes and insurance. Add the taxes and insurance and you're probably looking at $3,000 a month. Now, if you yourself are making $3,000 a month, or you're married to somebody and both of you are bringing in enough money worth $1,500 a month. Both of you are contributing $1,500 a month. Yeah, you can make it work. It's unfortunate that by the time you'll have finished paying for this house, that your interest will have been $258,000 and you'll have spent $759,000. So you'll have paid considerably, 
you know, more interest than you would have if you had been able to buy this place for three hundred thousand. You're paying five hundred thousand for the place, but that doesn't tell the whole story, because in the amount of time that it took for our housing values to go up to five hundred thousand, what also happened was the Federal Reserve raised the interest rates. So let's say you had excellent credit, you tried to get a loan right now for three hundred sixty thousand dollars on a. $500,000 house, you're not looking at a 3% interest rate. Oh, no, no, no. You're looking at as little as 6.5. So your monthly payments alone have gone up to 3160 from that 3% to 3160 Total interest that will be paid is $637,000. That $500,000 house will have cost you $1,137,722. Now, I tried to tell people to get their money into real estate. I told people, stop fucking around with this Bitcoin and stop fucking around with this nonsense. Would you believe there were people who actually took out mortgages to buy Bitcoin back when the shit was above 50000 because they were so certain it was going to 100000 There are people who are still gambling in Bitcoin because they think, oh, the banks are running to the end. The banks are coming to an end. I've got to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, well, fools and their money will always soon be parted. In fact, you know what's funny? I've got people who talk to me. They're like, oh, yeah, look, Bitcoin went up to 26. It went up to 27. I don't hear you talking about it. Yeah, well, guess what? Those people who pulled their money out of the banks, they put this shit in some a riskier asset now. And by the way, I don't want to hear anybody talking about Bitcoin until it gets back to the $60,000 that it was before it plummeted from 55 to 50 to 45 to 40. And now it's at, what is it, 27, 26? No, I don't want it. Listen, wake me when it gets above 55. Real estate is the best possible hedge on inflation. Real estate is the best possible investment you can make. Now, when some dummies think, oh yeah, well, I just invent Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin and Cardano. I just invest in those until I have enough money to buy a house. Yeah, well, when you saw yourself lose 60% of your value within the last year, uh, I think you're a little bit further away from your goal of saving up in order to be able to purchase a house. Not to mention, even if you had the money in Bitcoin, cashing it out and being able to actually use it to buy a house long term would be kind of hard because you'd be looking at, what, here in New York City, no less than $500,000 to buy a decent one-family house. And chances are, even at that base amount, you're looking at a ghetto with a crack house and a trap house that nobody wants to live in. I tried to tell people, I said, don't buy that car right now. Forget that car. Buy a house. That's what I tried to tell people. I did it myself. I kept saying, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to take this money. I'm going to go buy a track hawk. And I thought about it. I was like, wait a minute. This market is fucking collapsing. We have no idea if we're going to even live that long. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to spend this money on that bullshit. I'm going to wait. I'm going to buy property with it. I'm going to buy an investment property with that money. I went to, I told this story before. I went to, what is it? East Hills Chrysler. And I had my wallet in hand. I had my checkbook in hand. And I was like, yeah, so uh, when's that track haul coming? They're like, well, it won't be here for a little while, but I should tell you that we're going to be uh, marking them up. I'm like marking them up, marking them up to what? Oh, yeah, well, we're expecting to mark them up to about a, uh, they're going to be a $30,000 uh, market adjustment on them. So they literally look at me in the face and tell me, yeah, we're going to charge you $30,000 more just so that you have the ability to buy this car. Now, you, some of you who watch my videos, you may remember those cars came in, those cars sat on the fucking lots for almost a year, an entire year. And I made a series of videos called Count the Track Hawks because Either nobody wanted them, nobody wanted to spend $100,000 on them or whatever it was, but they sat in the backyards right up until uh, quarantine happened and then these people started stealing cars off the lots and stealing parts off of cars. 
And I and then when I look at my tenants and I look at the income and the profit that I've been making off my tenants, I thank myself. I'm like, thank God I didn't buy that fucking car. Now, fast forward to now, I'm getting ready to buy an electric Cadillac. As soon as that thing comes in, as soon well, first of all, they haven't even built them yet. They they start building the all-wheel drive models in April. So right now we're leaving March and we're going into April. So they're gonna build those cars. And uh, I'll have mine most likely by, I would say probably by June, maybe August, the latest. But I don't think it'll take that long. I think it takes about two months to build, test, and deliver. Whatever. Bottom line is, I'm going to get it. And I'm, I've got the money. I've, got, I've literally got the money cash waiting to buy it. I don't even want no car loan. I don't want a car loan because these fucking loans are fucked up at 7%. So I don't want, I don't want no car loan. I just don't want it. So I'm paying cash. Cash. I pay cash. There you go. And it's brand new and I pay cash. And that's it. So patience is a virtue. By waiting and not wasting my money, not buying into this fucking uh, SRT craze. They got these idiots going back and forth, wasting all their money on these cars. They got these markups on these cars, ripping these suckers off. And then they got to worry about whether or not their car is going to get stolen or whether or not somebody is going to gunpoint robbery their ass or whether or not somebody is not going to take parts off their car when they go inside McDonald's looking for coffee. So, no, I am so happy that I didn't waste my money. Patience is virtue. I did the right thing. Just like that last article said, they said, do nothing right now. Don't do anything hasty. If you want to put your money in a larger bank, well, that's your choice. You could do that. If your money is insured FDIC, you ain't got to worry about nothing because chances are you don't have $250,000 in the bank. Let's just be honest. Now, if you have more than $250,000 and you're not in a joint account, yeah, chances are maybe you should take some of that money and put it in another bank account. Maybe open up another bank account just so that you keep your balances below $250,000. I personally know people who have $750,000 in their bank account. Bus- small business owners. Um, one of them runs a Jamaican restaurant, a small, a very small Jamaican restaurant. I know another one who runs a corner store. Over a million dollars. Not only does he run a corner store... But he has a smoke shop, one of those, you know, where they sell weed and they're not supposed to, but they sell uh, tobacco products and they sell weed and they sell marijuana and CBD and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, he's got over a million dollars. He's got three smoke shops, one of which is a corner store and the other two are smoke shops. Just smoke shops. They just sell weed and shit. But I know, I personally know people who easily surpass these FDIC uh, maximums. So those are people who have to, right now, they have to, you know, take special considerations in order to protect their money. But most of us really don't have to worry like that. The bottom line is, this market, I don't even know what to tell you. Because the reality is, you're facing a situation where housing is unaffordable. The loans are going to be harder to get, as they said. Car loans are going to be harder to get. Um, some cars that you might actually want are unaffordable. So, you know, you, you may want that, uh, I don't know, what, what's a good car? You may want that Ram TRX 707 horsepower Hellcat truck. You may want that. However, you may only be able to afford a uh, Honda Ridgeline, you know, for $30,000 instead of uh, $137,000. That's just how it runs. But the bottom line is, you got to work, you got to live within your means. They're saying that, uh, you know, credit worthiness is going to be a big deal and they're going to be checking people's credit more carefully. You're just going to have to live within your means. So we're in a situation right now where if you go into a dealership, they're not going to tell you no, but what they're going to do is they're going to tell you a number that you can't afford, at which point you're going to automatically know the answer is no. So you're going to have to walk away disappointed. And you're just going to have to get used to it. My recommendation for right now, I wouldn't be buying anything. 
if if a house comes along and it's a private sale and they offer it to you and it's a steal and you can actually get it, okay, that's one thing I might consider. But other than that, right now, I wouldn't be buying anything. I wouldn't be buying anything at all, not unless you absolutely know you can afford it. Because the thing about it is, especially with this situation, you don't know how rough things are going to get. And things are going to be rough probably all summer long. You really don't know. You really, really don't know. So that's what I had to say. That's what I had to say. I had a couple people asking me about how to... uh, repair their credit. So I guess that's where I'll end off with this video. I think the thing that you have to understand is that credit tracks behavior. When they track your behavior, what they're basically doing is they're tracking the amount of money you borrow and they're tracking your history of paying back the amount of money you borrowed. So as you can say, it's like you have to pay your money back. You What is it? A Lannister always pays his debts? Yes, well, I'm a Lannister. You can call me Big Truck Lannister. A uh, Lannister always pays his debts. So as you can see, this was updated on, uh, what is this, uh, March 2nd, 2023. Um, I took a dip right there because, as you know, I uh, flip houses. So on a personal loan, I had taken a small dip. It was like... 20 points, and then I was right back up. You know why? Because I pay cash. So what I do is I use credit. I buy everything on credit, and I pay it right back immediately. I've, I've made videos about this before. Now, there's some people who try to challenge me, and they're like, oh, no, well, you don't have to pay it right back. Why are you paying every other night? All you got to do is wait till the end of the month, and you can just pay off the bill. No, 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 no. That's not how I do things. What I do is I pay every other night. As soon as the payment has posted where it's on the credit report, I pay immediately. As soon as I see it pop up on my credit card, I pay immediately. That's how I do it. And some people are like, oh, you don't have to do that. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure I don't have to do it. But you know what I'm doing? What I'm doing is I'm, I'm running a $0 balance they can clearly see that I'm not using a percentage of my credit. Because here's the problem. Most people don't seem to understand, no matter how much credit you have access to, you're not supposed to be using more than 5% of it if you want to keep good credit. And right now, credit's everything. Because credit gives you access to buy things that you would otherwise have to spend your own cash money to buy. The problem with spending your cash money is you get nothing for it. When I spend on a credit card, I get 1% back. 2% back, 3% back. And most people be like, oh, yeah, well, 1%, 2%, 3%, that's nothing. Yo, guess what? Getting 3% back is more than getting 0% back. I think that's simple math. That's like I take a dollar, I buy something, and three pennies comes back to me versus somebody using cash. They take their dollar, they buy something, they get nothing back except for what they bought. I think this is simple math, but then again, sometimes you got to argue with stupid people who don't have anything who feel it necessary to argue. I don't understand that, but that's just what it is. So anyway, as you can see, payment history, exceptional. As you can see, 100% on-time payments. No ifs, no buzzes. Zero late payments. Zero public records. Zero collections. Current debts, uh-oh, 30% of your overall score. 1% credit usage. Now, I, as I said, I pay it back every night. I buy my gasoline. I buy my oil, home heating oil for both of the houses. Uh, pay gas, heat for one. Uh, electric bills, oil bills, water bills, whatever it is, I pay it on the credit card. And as you can see, it says total balance on all revolving accounts is $319. But if you really look at my stuff, like it's it's actually lower than that. It's it's like zero because I, the problem is I'm always charging constantly because I have automatic payments. But the bottom line is I pay them off every single other night. Credit history, exceptional. How about that? Nine years, 10 months, average account age, 20 years, eight months, oldest account, credit Life, 
15% of your overall score is your credit history. So when you people are asking me, well, how do I improve my credit? Here's the problem. You're trying to improve your credit by doing something quickly because you're trying to get immediate results. Problem is they're tracking you over a long period of time, seven years, five years. They're tracking you over a long period of time. You may or may not be able to improve your credit right away. My recommendation to you is pay down and pay off your debts and keep them paid off. That alone will start to help you build your credit, period. That's it. What is this? New credit card applications. I haven't taken out any new credit cards from what I know. Uh, It says one year, 11 months is the newest account. Um, I think that the only reason why that was done was because the second house I bought required oil. And the oil company ran the credit. That's why. Uh, types of credit, 10% of your overall score. It says you have 14 revolving accounts, 14 installment loans. All of them, I assure you, are paid off. All of them, I assure you. So that's just that. That's what my credit history looks like right there. Now, I notice some people, are, oh, yeah, well, credit doesn't matter. You just buy everything in cash. Credit doesn't matter. Yeah, well, what happens when you need to get something that you can't simply buy in cash? What happens when you try to buy insurance policies on your, your, new, car, your new electric Cadillac and the insurance company says, yeah, we're going to run your credit? Oh, but I don't want you to run my credit. And they say, well, then you can hang the fuck up and you can call uh, Allstate, call Dennis Habert. You called Geico. We're running your credit. That's it. And if you don't like it, hang up and call Dennis Habert. But, but, but I wanted Geico. What are you talking about? Why, why should you have to run my credit? Because that's what we do. That's the system. Give me your, give me your social security number right now. That's how it works. Suppose you need health insurance. Suppose you need health insurance. Suppose you call up Cigna. Suppose you call Cigna because you want dental insurance for your dental. You need your teeth fixed. You know what Cigna's going to tell you? Give me your uh, social security number, please. Well, why do you need my social security number? Because we're going to run your credit, stupid. And you'll be like, but I don't want you to run my credit. And then they're going to be like, you know what? Hang up on this fool. Click. That's how, that's how the real world works. That's how it works. I know some people don't like it, but that's how it works. That's just, that. that's it. They're not playing with you. <laughs> They're not playing with you. Oh, but I don't want you to run my credit. Credit does not determine the type of person I am. Hey, uh, Mike, hang up on that fool. Click. That's how it works. You better keep your credit. I, I have been pushing this message for a long time. There have been people who tried challenging me and shit. All of a sudden, they disappeared into the ether. I've, I've been telling people, stay away from Bitcoin. There have been people who challenged me on that shit. When it dropped below 50000 I haven't heard from any of them. They just disappeared. This is how it works, guys. I'm sorry. This is the real world here. This is what you're dealing with. This is how the real world works. You have to keep your credit up. The easiest things I can recommend you do is... Pay down your debts as quickly as you can. Pay them off. Simultaneously try to save cash, savings account. Help you to build up a debt bomb so that this way if there's a large credit remaining that you need to pay off, you can just pay it off. But the bottom line is you got to pay your debts off and you got to keep them paid off. I run a zero balance. I I can't say it any better than that. Now, if you can't run 100% zero balance, the only things you're allowed to not have a zero balance are are your home loan, your car lease, or your car finance. They don't expect those loans to be paid off immediately. But what I'm talking about is people who go out shopping for groceries, like they're buying chips and a big gulp from 7-Eleven, and they buying a uh, Lay's dip, and they buying bread, and they buying a uh, corned beef, and all that stuff, and bacon and eggs. Listen, if you're buying groceries with your credit card, yeah, you need to pay that off immediately. So my strategy 
is I only spend what I can afford to pay off in cash immediately. So that this way, if I go shopping today, I get the bill tomorrow, I pay it off tomorrow. And that means it's paid off and that's a zero dollar balance. And that's it. Now, your home loans, your car loans, you don't have to pay those off immediately. Your credit score will still go up. Bottom line is you can't miss any payments. You can't be late on any payments. I think that's simple enough to understand. And that's it. And that's it. It's a very, very simple strategy. I can't say much more than that. See, some people, they think that when they say, oh, yeah, could you show me how to fix my credit? They think that you could fix your credit overnight. No, 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 no. It does not work like that. Anybody who tries to tell you you can fix your credit overnight is lying to you. Anybody who tells you you can fix your credit within just a couple of months is lying to you. What they usually try to do is they usually try to force inquiries of your credit in order to make it seem as if your credit has improved in a short period of time. Problem is, for the most part, it might only go up a couple of points and then it'll fall right back down. Your long-term credit history is what's important here. They're looking at law, just like I just read to you the article from the fucking bank. They're looking at long-term credit. They're looking at long-term behavior. They want to see how much money have you borrowed to buy cars in the past. Have you paid that money back? Have you paid that money back on time? How much money have you borrowed to buy a house in the past? Have you paid that money back on time? That's what they're looking for. If you do that, your credit will be fine. If you don't do that, well, you're going to be living on welfare or handouts from the government for a long period of time. This, I think now more than ever, I think COVID forced people to reevaluate their credit and their stance in uh, finances. I think a lot of people were forced to reevaluate themselves because what happened was when they saw those interest rates go up and all of a sudden just whipping out their credit card wasn't so easy anymore. See, I had already built up the discipline to maintain those zero dollar balances. A lot of people don't have that discipline. A lot of people still don't have that discipline. And the issue is they want to be able to use their credit cards to supplement their income. That doesn't work anymore. When interest rates were 3% or less, yeah, that was cool. But nah, it doesn't work that way anymore. If you're carrying debt on a card, if you're carrying more than four or $5,000, the interest rates alone are pushing you up in those monthly payments. And you're feeling it. And there's nothing you can do except pay the whole thing off. The problem is, if you're driving around in some luxury car or you're living in a house that you can't really afford because it's beyond your means, chances are you're feeling it now more than ever. And if you're paying off student loans that right now are paused and you haven't been paying down those interest payments and you've just been adding to the principal, yeah, you're, you're going to feel it. That's the bottom line. You're going to feel it. But you know what? Regardless what happens, this is me right here. This is me. 850. I got it printed out. I got this on my wall. I got this in a frame right now. What I, I got my 850 years ago, and I kept it as high as I could. The only time you see it dip, even though you're looking right there, it dipped just 20 points, and it's right back up. And that's it. And that's how you got to do it. So, me personally, I can't be bothered to argue anymore because at a certain point, you just get tired. But uh, that's just it. That's what I look like right here. So, uh, that's all I had to say. You got questions, you can put them in the uh, comment section.